Let's pray. Father, we just ask your blessing upon the sharing of your word this morning. Let it be a blessing to our hearts. Let it challenge us. And let us not forget this week what it says to us. And let us be changed, Father. Lord, we love you so very much. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, a word of congratulations to all of you. Um, you all were natural, really naturals at birth. And it didn't take long for you to find your real talent. And after many years of practice and painstaking hours of doing the same thing over and over again, no matter what time of day it was, you were willing to put in the work. So congratulations. I can finally tell you that you have turned pro. You all are professional complainers. And no, that's not a good thing. There's no big contract with that. There's no endorsement deals that come. Just continued practice over the game of life where we find, we, we, excuse me, constantly find ways to complain. Now, before you start throwing things at me, just hear me out. We complain about the potholes and then we complain about the traffic behind the people that are fixing the potholes. We complain when it's too hot. We complain when it's too. We complain when we have too many clothes and don't know what to wear. We complain about the food when we're sitting at a table and being served that it's taking too long. We complain, we complain, we complain. And what we've done is we've allowed our vision, our view to be blurred, our hearts to be darkened, and our mind to be reshaped. Where we live in a way that we are constantly missing the grace. So this morning I want to encourage you to not miss the grace. Don't miss the grace. So let's turn to Luke chapter 17. And in Luke chapter 17 I want to share a story of a man who had every reason to do that very thing to complain, but he didn't miss the grace. And my hope for today and tomorrow and throughout the week is that we will remind ourselves of those four words over and over again, don't miss the grace. So Luke chapter 17, and we'll be looking in 11 through 19, I um, read this passage in my devotions a while back, and I said, that'll preach. I wanted to, so I wrote that one down, and I couldn't wait to share it with you this morning. So it says in verse 11 of Luke chapter 17, it says, on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee, and as he entered a village, he was met by 10 lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourself to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. And then one of them, when he saw he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, were not ten cleansed? Were, where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. So don't miss the grace before Jesus. We'll start there. I want, you, I want you to ponder this statement with me or this question. Did you know your salvation story began or started before you met Jesus? Hillsong recently sang a song with the lyrics, I was found before I was lost with grace to spare. And we're going to share that song with you later in the service. You see, these lepers, their story began even before they met the Savior. Let me explain that to you. You see, Jesus had to make his way to them. He had to walk down really between the 
the setting of this story is between Samaria and Galilee. And eight chapters before, Jesus was making his way to Jerusalem from Samaria. He was walking down, and this is where he finds a village of lepers. And the reason why maybe they don't say a name or a city is because this could very well be a makeshift village of where these lepers were living because they weren't welcome anywhere else. Now, did Jesus go out of his way to see them? I believe, yes, he did. I can't say that for sure, but it seems that way. We just mentioned that eight chapters ago in Luke, he was making his way to Jerusalem. So he's slowly making his way there, and he decides to stop in a quote-unquote village to see ten lepers. Yes, I do believe he went a bit out of his way to see these people that were suffering. And so we can say that statement that everything that had to happen for them to meet Jesus is grace. And everything for you to meet Jesus, everything that had to happen for you to meet Jesus, I believe is grace. Don't miss the grace. Now I want to share a story, and she's in nursery I guess this morning, but I want to share a story of when I met my wonderful wife, Shannon, and it is full of grace. Now, uh, we met, uh, some of you know this story, some of the details. We met at a church picnic in 1988. She was in a stroller, and I was in a squirt gun fight. <laughs> I remember it vividly. Um, and so uh, our eyes met, and I went up to the stroller and got on one knee, and I asked her to marry me, and that was the story. No, that's not how it happened. Some of you are like, really? No, no, that's, that's not how it happened. The reason why I wanted to say that to maybe a little shock you a little bit is because there was so many grace moments from that squirt gun fight, which I, I was winning that, I'm pretty sure. Um, the squirt gun fight all the way till I did get on one knee. So many grace moments from Shannon's dad being transferred from his job to here in Columbus to going to the same church um, all our growing up to her brother being my close friend to her parents being mentors to me uh, throughout my youth group time to them being basically family to me to when I went through a very difficult time. Uh, to going to college, these are all grace moments, to when I went to college at Cedarville, when God made sure that close to 2,000 female students failed to see me as a suitable life partner. <laughs> you know, God blinded their eyes. <laughs> Scott, I can't even say that without laughing. <laughs> it was a grace... I didn't see that as a grace moment. That was very hard for me. But that was a grace moment because little did I know that just weeks after graduating, I would find my one in a million. And I would go on my first date with Shannon. And then the second date, I knew that I would marry her. And you could say, what took me so long? But all of that, before I said I do, those were all grace Moments, grace upon grace upon grace. And if you look, those of you that have trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you look at all the moments that had to happen before you met Christ, those are grace moments. Grace upon grace. And it is grace, perhaps, that brought you here today if you have never trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you've never met Jesus then grace brought you here today. So what do we know about these 10 people? I looked it over and over again, and it looks like 10 people, not necessarily 10 men like we recognize uh, typically in our Sunday school stories. But what do we know about these 10 people, these 10 lepers? Four things. One, they are diseased. Okay, They have leprosy. It's usually... From what I understand, at least now, it's not terminal. It was a torturous disease. It attacked the nervous system. Um, it would cause these rashes all over the body. It would degenerate tissue. It would deform the body and the skin. Today, I did a little research. It's called Hansen's disease. Number two, they're outcasts. 
They're outcasts from family and society. Um, in Jewish culture, this disease was really seen as a result of sin. So they're like, get away from us. Um, they had to, in this case, they lived on the border because they weren't um, welcome in Galilee and they weren't welcome in Samaria. So they simply lived on the border. And then they were filthy and poor. They most likely were living in poverty conditions. They had nothing. They were thrown from their families, from their jobs, from their society. They had nothing with them. Um, and they were just suffering in their disease. And then finally, they were hopeless. What hope did they have? They had no family. They had no future. They had no cure. They were simply lepers without hope. So I say to you this morning, who does this remind you of? And the answer to that question is you. It's you before you met Jesus. Because we have this disease called sin. And all of us are born with sin. And we are affected by it. And it crosses all social and ethnic boundaries. Everyone is affected by sin. It is a horrible disease that all of us have at birth. Two, we are outcasts. We are outcasts from a relationship with God our Father. Ever since the Garden of, Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve took from the fruit and sinned, ever since then we have been outcasts from a relationship with God the Father. Broken. And then we are filthy and poor. We are filthy in sin. We are spiritually poor. Whether you felt it or not, before you met Jesus, that's the state you were in. And then finally, you were hopeless. You didn't have hope of eternal future until you met Jesus. You were lost. Lost like the lepers. Until what? Until they saw Jesus in the distance. And they said, Lord, have mercy on us. Until they met Jesus. They were diseased. They were outcast. They were filthy and poor. And they were hopeless. And we were the same way until we called out to our Savior, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. And that day, as it says in Luke chapter 17, that day they met Jesus. So the second thing we find is don't miss the grace in meeting Jesus. Don't miss the grace and meeting Jesus, verses 14 through 18. Now, on May 8th of this year, I don't, some of you may have seen this story. It was a, you know, a national publicized story of Amanda Eller. Now, don't tell the end of the story yet, okay? But Amanda Eller went on a three-mile jog on a trail in Hawaii, and she disappeared. Uh, no one knew where she went, so they went and found her car, and they saw inside her car was her water bottle, water, rewind, water bottle, there we go, phone and wallet were inside her car, so obviously her family thought the worst. What happened to her? If she had all these things in here, why didn't she have them with her? Well, 17, 17 days went by, and really all hope was lost. This was in a nature reserve that covered over 2,000 acres. Now the, some of us were in Hawaii recently and saw this, how beautiful it is, but this was a nature reserve that was covered by trees, had little road development. I mean, what hope did they really have of finding Amanda? That is until, as I said, 17 days later after she disappeared, a rescue helicopter of three men saw a living miracle waving her arms from down below. It was Amanda, and she was alive. Now, you could show that picture of the rescue team with her, and I don't think that smile probably left her face for a number of days. Here's what happened. Here's a little backstory of how tough Amanda was during these 17 days. Uh, she found herself in the fight of her life. On the third day, because she was there 17 days, on the third day, she fell off a cliff and broke her leg and tore her meniscus. On the third day, keep in mind she wasn't found until the 17th day. Well, how did she survive? Well, she kept fighting. She survived by uh, drinking water from a stream, eating berries that she found, and eating the two moths that landed on her during the time that she was laying there 
and she slept in a wild boar's cave. I would think hoping that wild boar would not come back anytime soon. That's how she survived. And I'm going to guess that Amanda Eller will never, ever forget the day that she was found. And I'm going to guess that when you were found by Jesus Christ, when you met Jesus, that you will never, ever forget that day that you put your faith in Jesus Christ. And in Luke chapter 17, this was the day that the lepers found Jesus. They got to meet the Savior, Jesus Christ. And it was a day that they were healed. Now, I find this fascinating that I didn't realize about this story until I studied it, that Jesus told the lepers to go show themselves to the priest, which we know that is found in the Old Testament. That was a common tradition. But here's the thing that many commentators pointed out, is that this was an act of faith. Why? Because in order for them to go to the priest, in order for them to show themselves to the priest, they had to be cured first. I guess I always thought that when we went to the priest, it was the cure that happened then. So no, it was the curing. As you, as you read the passage, you'll see it there. They were cured as they were going to the priest. I mean, can you imagine that? I, I don't know if you picture that in my mind. I like going into the story a little bit, right? Ten lepers. They're, they're like, Jesus says, okay, go show yourselves to the priest. Okay, Jesus, we're going to go do that. And they they start booking it and going toward the priest. And they're like, hey, Mary, your face is clearing up. It looks really nice. Oh, hey, thanks, Larry. Hey, Larry, can you? It's that. Wait, it, never mind. I'm okay. Hey, Ernie, um, when's the last time you ran? <laughs> oh, it was eight years ago. I ran eight. What? I'm running. Why am I? Look, I'm healed. Like, can you imagine the trip over to see the priest? They're running to see the priest. They're like, what's going on? You look great. All right. This, I don't even have an itch on my back. You know what I'm saying? The joy that they had to have, that they're finally healed. Who knows how many years that they have suffered through this disease. They can go back to their families, their, their jobs, their whole society. It's all been brought back to them. The amount of joy that these lepers had to feel to be healed. And there's... Everything has come back to them. Their whole lives. And yet what? Only one. Only one turns back to Jesus. After he gave them everything. Everything. It's a lesson for us today. The Savior that has given us everything. Do we turn back to him? And the only one that came back, he happened to be a Samaritan. Why is that significant? Well, we know in biblical history that this was the one, the um, ethnic group, the Samaritans, who were called dirty, rotten, half-breeds by the Jews. And he's the one that comes back to the king of the Jews and worships him. Now, it's interesting that Dr. Luke here does not focus on the physical healing. He simply says one word, they were cleansed, boom. And he's ready to move on to the spiritual. He shifts his focus into the spiritual awakening that happened in this Samaritan's life. And four things that this Samaritan did after he was healed is a lesson to all of us. Number one, he turned back. Number two, he praised God. Number three, he fell on his face and worshiped the Savior, and then fourth, he thanked the Savior. So let me ask you this, based on this story and the lessons that we can learn, do you do this? <clears throat> Excuse me. Those of you that have met Jesus Christ, do you do these four things? Do you turn back? And what I mean by that is, are you so focused and worried about the things in your life that you're rarely turning back to Jesus Christ? Is it all about your way and what you want to do and, and your list and accomplishing all these things and your worries and you forget to turn back to the Savior? You want, I mean, you have to wonder, 
what those other nine did after they were healed. Where did they go? Did they go straight back to their lives and their jobs and their families and what they wanted to do instead of turning back to the Savior and giving Him some time in their lives? And then secondly, they, He praised God. It's a simple question here. How many times did you praise God this week? And then third, He fell on His face at Jesus' feet. What that is, is just humble worship. How often do you come to church in humble worship where you're saying, I'm going to sit in this seat and I'm going to just allow God to change me. I'm going to humbly sit here and realize that I have some things to work on and I need to worship the Savior. I need to worship God and He needs to change me because I got some problems. And then fourth, He thanked the Savior. And that's what we'll be doing today is thanking our Savior Jesus Christ and the sacrifice He made on the cross. But may I encourage you of this. Don't let today be the only day that you thank Jesus Christ. Let Him be thanked every day of your life for His sacrifice and who He is in your lives. See, the passage today is truly a mirror of who we are. You who have met met the Savior, is this you? Are you doing these four things in your life? I encourage you to write those four things down. Turn back, praise God, humble worship, and thanking the Savior. And maybe circle one of those and say, that's me, I need to work on that. Maybe it's E, all the above. Okay, So just work on that this week. I know God is speaking to your hearts, and I know there's something that we all need to work on in those four things. And then Jesus turns to the leper and really asks the questions that can be asked to us today for those that have met Jesus. Were we not cleansed? Where are we? Why are we not at the feet of Jesus? And then are we giving praise? Good questions to ask of yourselves if you've met Jesus Christ. And then I think the 90% Versus the 10%, I think that's significant. Now, I don't have scientific data to back this up, but I think 9 out of 10 times we miss the grace. Maybe it's just me, but I'm going to go out on a limb here and say 90% of the time we pass over the grace that God gives us each and every day. I'm going to give you a few examples. Like a red light that prevents us from an accident two miles ahead. Or missing out on a bid for a house, not realizing that there's a better deal that's going to happen a month later. A difficult breakup in junior high, high school as a young adult when God is saving your one in a million for later. A job interview that goes poorly so God can give you the job that he wants you to have. See, in those moments, nine out of ten times, we're not saying, thank you, Lord, falling at the feet of Jesus and thanking him and praising him. No, it's about our way. We're going our way. I want that job. How dare this red light be here? It should be green for me. I need this job. I need this. I'm going my way, and I'm not turning back to Jesus and thanking him for what's happening in my life, and we forget the sacrifice of our Savior on the cross, and we don't turn back to him. We face our way and not his way, and I'm looking at myself here, and I say nine out of ten times, that's me. At least I miss the grace. And recently, God has been teaching me this, that find those little grace moments. Don't miss them. You only have one life to live, and constantly we're missing out on the grace that God gives us. And, little, and even if it's little grace moments, I've been calling these little grace moments in the last couple of weeks of our, in our house and trying to share them with our kids. When a glass of milk is caught before it spills. A little grace moment. Or when you catch your child falling off a chair with your foot. That also happened. That's a grace moment. (laughs) Something goes on sale. A parking spot opens. Or weather cooperates for a special occasion. Those are little grace moments. And we miss them. I'm going to put a quote on the, the screen for you of Warren Wearsby. He says, too often we are content to enjoy the gift, but we forget the giver. Nine out of ten times in my life, that's true. God's graces, don't miss them. 
There's only one guy in this story that didn't miss the grace of Jesus Christ. So he turned back, he shouted praise, and he fell to worship Jesus, and he thanked him. And one day, if you trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, and one day after this life is over, and your disease of sin is finally completely healed, and you're at the gates of heaven, and you see the Savior, and you do those four things, you turn to Him, you shout out praise, and you fall to worship Him, and you thank Him. One day, if you've met Jesus and trusted in him, him as your Savior, you'll get to do that. But let me just share something with you and encourage you. Do that today. And don't wait till heaven to turn to Him and to praise Him and to fall on your face and to worship Him and thank Him. Do that today. Don't miss the grace. And then finally, don't miss the grace with Jesus, with Jesus. Christ says to this former leper, he says, your faith has made you well. Now we know that he's already been healed physically, so he's talking spiritually here, healed, here. There we go. The soul has been healed. If we could just turn just briefly to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, verse 24. It says this, Acts 20, 24, But I do not account my life of any value, nor any precious to myself. Here's what I want you to remember. If only I may finish my course and the ministry that I've received from who? The Lord Jesus. To testify to the gospel of the what? Grace of God. Wow. The course and the ministry that we've been given by God, by Jesus Christ, I should say, and it's because of the grace of God that we even have that. So don't miss the grace that you have with Jesus Christ. The course and the ministry that you have begins once you've met Jesus Christ. When you've been born again, your life is now different. You now have a purpose in life with the gospel to be able to give that to others and to live out the life that's been purposed for you. You see, once you've met Jesus Christ at that moment, the Holy Spirit gives you something that's called spiritual gifts. You've been literally given a gift that is to be used from the Holy Spirit. You can't tell me that statement isn't full of grace. And oftentimes, even in that, we miss the grace. We say, why can't I be more hospitable like them or teach like him or witness like her? I think we need to remember this statement. We're sometimes so focused on who we are not, we miss the grace of who we are. Sometimes we're so focused on who we are not, we miss the grace of who we are in Jesus Christ. Your gifts, your talent, your family life, and even your struggles, they can be seen as grace. Because God has put them in your life for a purpose in Jesus Christ. That right there is grace grace. As we look at how many came back to Jesus Christ, to kind of wrap up things, just one. And we look at our own lives and think of how many times we miss grace, because I think many of us today, including myself, we're often hoping and praying for things like healing and help with the relationship or getting something from God, and those aren't necessarily bad, but those were very much on the heart, it seems, of those other nine lepers. They wanted to get something from Jesus. 
I think many times, nine times out of ten, and I'm pointing at myself here as well, is that many times we are not giving to God. It's all about getting from God. And instead, we should be giving Him praise, giving Him our talents, giving to Him financially, giving Him our time. And when we do those things, when we have that mindset, when we have that heart of giving to God, like that one leper did, it becomes life-changing. And it allows us to not miss the grace that is in our lives each and every day, every hour, every minute, the grace that God gives us. And this guy, he didn't miss the grace, can't wait to meet him in heaven. The guy that was able to come back to the feet of Jesus and thank him. The guy whose life was changed forever. Listen, if you live this way where you're giving to God, where you're not missing the grace, when you're, it allows you to enjoy your life. The grace that God gives you. I'm not telling you that your life's going to be easy. That's not what I'm saying, but... When you don't miss the grace in your life, the joy in your heart is different. The other, the other path is to go your way. Go your own way. And there's two paths here. Christ says here, in, uh, let me make sure I have it right. He says in verse 19, rise and go your way. That's the way that Jesus wants you to go. Or you could go your own way. So I ask you today, if you have met Jesus, where are you going? What is your purpose? Are you living in a way that shows your faith? Are you like the other nine lepers? Where they met Jesus and they went on their own way. No, your life should be like the one who came back. That one leper who was praising Jesus who was now sent on a mission from Jesus Christ to live by faith. Lost before Jesus, found by Jesus, and given purpose with Jesus. Those are grace moments. Don't miss the grace. The grace of the everyday and the grace of Jesus Christ. And maybe... You are here today and you, your eyes have been opened to who Jesus is, the grace of Jesus. Everything in your life has been leading up to this moment and you know that God is working on your heart and you know that you can't ignore all the grace moments that he's brought in your life up to this point. And you know that you need to call out to Jesus Christ just like that leper did in that forest, in that village. Because he's the only way that can bring you hope and can save you from the disease of sin. Only Jesus Christ can do that. And it's only by grace that we even have the opportunity to call on him. So I encourage you to meet Jesus today. Meet his grace. You can pray in your heart, in your seat, or we'll have prayer counselors after the service that will be able to talk to you and lead you through that decision. But don't leave here today without trusting in Jesus Christ as your Savior. Your life will be changed. Just like that leper, his life was completely changed. And on the other nine lepers, their life was completely changed. But here's the difference. The one leper, his eternal life was changed. And that could be you today. So don't miss the grace. Uh, before we uh, go to communion and celebrate the grace of Jesus' sacrifice, I'd like to invite the Bells to come. Tim and Andy Bell are going to come and share their story of when they met Jesus and the grace that they found in Jesus Christ. So we've been married for 38 years, and <laughs> um, besides being attracted to you, Andy, why 
did I want to marry you and join a family where your dad put carrots in the spaghetti, <laughs> your mom was called Bird, not to mention the characters of Uncle Gobel and Aunt Heaney. <laughs> oh, we didn't talk about this, but <laughs> <laughs> oh, one of the reasons I married you was because you were a Christian, and that was the priority of my life, and among other things. So tell us how you were saved first. So I grew up just two blocks west of here. I was the youngest of four children. My parents did not attend church, but we did. A light blue bus, church bus, came by at 8.30 every Sunday for the four of us to get on. We were welcomed by Wayne Price and Mr. Coons, uh, and we went to a sister church. I remember going to church as young as the age four. My Sunday school teachers told me about Adam and Eve, and they told me about Noah and the things that God did through them. After hearing this for several years at the age of seven, I asked the Lord into my heart. During a VBS session, I confessed my sins, realized that I would not go to heaven without him, and asked the Lord into my heart. As we grew up, I continued to go to Sunday school on the big blue bus. Eventually, as my brother and sister moved off to the service and to college, I was the only one getting on the bus. God provided many believers in my life to encourage my walk with the Lord, and I loved it, and I still do. The grand staffs began to pick me up and I remember going early, earlier to church than normal as we served passing the Sunday school papers and the offering plates. I met school friends who also were going to my church, and we were actively, actively involved in the local church. Our youth group had Bible drills, and we went to camp. We skated, and we met, and we prayed as one. Awana was introduced to us at the, in the eighth grade. I was a leader by the ninth grade, and I loved it. Memorizing scripture was easier then. As a youth group at church, we held each other accountable. We made lifelong friends, and the friends with Beth, Roger, and Denise were made as well as my husband. My youth leaders led a godly life. They taught me how to live and grow in the Lord scripturally. I know what was right and what was wrong. I knew how to avoid the sins of the world. I had no desire to get involved with them. But I did pray, I talked with them, and I still do. Psalm 96.2 says, Sing unto the Lord, bless his name, proclaim his salvation from day to day. There have been up and down times in my walk, but I've learned and I'm still learning. I have godly, accountable females in my life. I touch base with them at least weekly. I try to surround myself with those who love the Lord as well. Getting involved with others is crucial for growth. In the 1990s, Seems like a long time ago. Uh, the Lord had other plans in our life. Uh, my brother, my father, and my mother all passed away in a very short period of time. But that was the Lord's grace and his timing. And they met Christ prior to that. I remember my dad saying he wished he had done it sooner. Don't wait. Let today be the day. So, Tim, why do you think I married you? Probably because I was older and wiser. <laughs> that wasn't it. <laughs> that wasn't it. Um, well, I'll tell you my story. Um, I grew up in a small town up in Logan County. We had about 600 people in our town. We had one traffic light, which the state took away about 30 years ago. <laughs> and I had a pretty uh, normal childhood. I mean, uh, when I was 13, I watched the Cleveland Browns win the championship of the National Football League. <laughs> I mean, that's normal stuff, right? So um, I went on to college up at Ohio State, and then I settled over here on the west side. I got a job with the Ohio Department of Transportation. And in 1978, uh, a young woman came into our section, and she was a Christian. And one day, I remember standing in the hall at a copy machine, and she came up to me and she said, what would happen to you if you died tomorrow? And I told her I would go to hell. And she was shocked that I realized you know, what the state of my soul was. So we continued to talk about things and uh, develop a friendship. And one day, uh, you know, several weeks later, she gave me this tract. It's called Four Spiritual Laws. It was put out by Campus Crusade for Christ. And it tells the basic gospel message that God is holy, man is a sinner, uh, that there's a gap or a divide between us because of our sin, and you have to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Um, and so on August 31st, uh, 1978, um, I prayed the prayer that was in here, and I asked Jesus to come into my life. Now, I had done that one or two times previously in uh, 
high school when I was growing up in the Methodist church, but I never felt any differently about it, and I wasn't sure that I was truly a Christian. But the page in this tract um, that was so important and critical to me knowing and believing that it was real, um, there's a diagram in here that has a train and another car and then a caboose. And the train is labeled fact, the second car is labeled faith, and the caboose is labeled feelings. And this page is what I was counting on. It says, do not depend upon feelings. The promise of God's word, the Bible, not our feelings, is our authority. The Christian lives by faith and the trustworthiness of God himself and his word. This train diagram illustrates the relationship between facts, faith, and feelings. The train will run with or without the caboose. However, it would be useless to attempt to pull the train by the caboose. In the same way, we as Christians do not depend upon feelings or emotions, but we place our faith in the trustworthiness of God and the promises of his word. And that's what sealed the deal for me and made me understand that I was truly saved. Now, there's been times in my past where I failed, but my failure isn't final. Jesus remains eternally faithful, and we continue to hold or to depend upon his word and be held in his hands. So to those of you who have sat here before and have not taken that action and not made that decision, I would ask you the same question that I was asked 41 years ago. What's going to happen to you if tomorrow is your last day on earth?